Okay, so final speaker is John Preskill, and I think he will tell us where we are heading. And where we've been. Hey, thanks for sticking around. I thought you'd all be on your way home, but I guess it was hard to tear yourselves away because this has been such a great meeting. And we already thanked Javi and other people who helped, but you know what, we, I don't think we've thanked these guys yet who were the visionaries who put this great meeting together. So let's thank Ken and Jake. <laughs> now my title implied I would say something about history. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But I think it is useful, especially for those of you who grew up with the idea of quantum error correction, to step back and think about how remarkable it is. And one measure of that is the reaction of the physics community in the early days, including very good physicists who were skeptical about the idea of scalable quantum computing. Of course, the discovery of Shor's algorithm generated a great deal of excitement, and it drew a lot of people into the field, including me. But uh, good physicists were skeptical. One was Bill Unruh. This was less than two months after the appearance of Shor's original paper, in which he did some calculations and argued that we couldn't extend a com uh, quantum computation much beyond the natural decoherence time of the physical system we're using. Another was Rolf Landauer, who, as much as anyone, recognized the deep connections between information science and physics. And for Landauer, his biggest concern was not decoherence so much as the small rotations of the state in Hilbert space, which would accumulate over time, which he thought were analogous to the errors in an analog system and couldn't be corrected. And even after the idea of quantum error correcting codes was introduced, uh, Serge Haroche, for one, who had spent years of his life studying decoherence in detail in the laboratory, was a naysayer. He called the large-scale quantum machine a computer scientist's dream, but an experimenter's nightmare. Well, maybe it's still so. But the idea of quantum error correction, the viability of the concept, gradually gained wider acceptance. And a dominant figure of the time was Peter Shore, who not only discovered the factoring algorithm, but published the first paper with an example of a quantum error correcting code, what we now call the Shore code, or the Bacon Shore code. And he also was the first to explain the idea of how we can fault tolerantly measure error syndromes and execute a universal set of quantum gates fault tolerantly uh, acting on a code space. I was interested in the error correction problem at the time, but I was hung up on the idea that what we wanted to do was use error detecting codes and either the Zeno effect or energy barriers to keep the computation on track in the code space. And I say that only to emphasize that what seems quite obvious to us now was not obvious at the time, at least not to me. And another major hero of the subject was Alexei, who had the idea of topological codes, the toric code, in 1996 and proposed computing with non-abelian anions uh, the next year. I met Kitayev in 97. At the time, I was very interested in non-abelian anions and in quantum error correction. And it never occurred to me that there was a connection between them uh, until the day I met him and I got very excited about his ideas. That summer, I had some undergraduate students working on projects. One was Eric Dennis, who was working on studying the coding of the Toric code. The other was Walt Ogborn, who was trying to show that we could do universal gates with quantum double anions. And I said to Alexei, you know, the Toric code is good for fault-tolerant quantum computing. And he said, no, the Toric code is for memory. Non-abelian anions are for computing. And 
Well, he was right in a way because I couldn't figure out how to do a universal set of fault tolerant gates in the Torah code. So I was stuck, and then I went back and asked him, how do we do that? And seemingly overnight, he invented magic state distillation. Uh, he might have been thinking about it for a while, but he more or less came back the next day and said, well, here's how you can do it. Uh, and it was, it was another uh, five years before the great paper of Bravi and Kataev uh, explained that idea in detail. But we were pleased that we had a way of doing universal computing with the Torah code. What we missed at the time was the idea of code deformations or lattice surgery to do the gates in a two-dimensional layout. And when Rausendorf realized that, that was also a, a big advance. And incidentally, he also came up with the idea of using Majorana modes, which is the approach to topological quantum computing, which is now generating so much excitement experimentally. And of course, I'm being unfair to lots of other people who made uh, great contributions around the same time, as well as uh, a later generation of heroes who contributed many important ideas. And now all, all the people here at, at this meeting, a new generation uh, pushing the subject forward brilliantly, uh, which is great to see. But I think when historians of science look back on the idea of quantum error correction, these two figures, Shore and Kataev, will loom very large. So QEC is a good idea. It was first done uh, 10 years ago, organized by the two guys in the front, uh, Daniel Ladar and uh, Todd Brun. You'll recognize some of your friends if you look at the picture for a while. So we've had 10 years of QEC meetings. This is the fourth one. And uh, we heard uh, from Jake that uh, we have aspirations to make this uh, sustainable uh, celebration of prog progress in the field. And uh, that will be a very good thing uh, if it continues. They've been very productive meetings. So I was thinking if you were you know, at, at the first QEC meeting and you looked at the way the field looks today, what would surprise you the most? Well, these are the things that surprised me the most from that perspective. I didn't expect the interest and investment by industry to ramp up so suddenly, like it has in the last couple of years. And I didn't at the time expect that not all, but many string theorists would, by 2017, accept the idea that quantum error correction is an important concept in quantum gravity research. As far as the first thing goes, it raises two questions for all of us to think about, which is, you know, what do we do about all the hype? I think when expectations become unrealistic, it's possible that somebody can get hurt. And I think um, all of us should, when the opportunity arises, emphasize that this is a long-term enterprise, that there's much fundamental research still to be done for quantum computing to realize its promise. I'm actually very optimistic in the long run about the potential of quantum technologies to have a transformative effect on society, but if our expectations are inflated in the short run, that could turn out to be harmful. And the other question is, what's the role for the academic community as things move forward, as big investment and in infrastructure is uh, being invested by commercial companies to advance the technology? What should the rest of us be doing? But there's plenty to do. I think this field, quantum error correction in particular, but more broadly, quantum information is really a frontier in the exploration of the physical sciences. And we should look at it from that perspective, an opportunity to explore nature in ways that weren't possible before. And as far as the technology goes, we should be thinking about the longer term, the things that are not catching the attention of industry today, but could have a big impact on how the technology advances potentially decades from now. Well, one unsurprise is that the surface code is still on top. By the first QEC meeting, it had already been established as the preferred way of pushing scalable quantum computing based on the technology that was in the near term foreseeable. And that's still the case uh, because of its geometric locality and its high threshold. And um, 
Of course, we'd like to be able to decode it faster, and it would be nice if we could come up with lower overhead ways of doing non-clipper gates, and it's good that people are still thinking about that. It won't necessarily always be the case that the surface code is the answer. Uh, one way things could change eventually is that geometric locality won't be viewed as so fundamental a restriction. There's no reason of principle why we can't have quantum wires that connect together qubits that are far apart, and that opens new opportunities for fault tolerance. Or maybe when gate error rates are much smaller, we'll have different ways of doing things that are better, or maybe we'll just come up with a better idea. So one way I think about the way the subject changes is from the perspective of how I teach it. I've been teaching quantum error correction at Caltech since 1998, and every time I do it, I ask myself, are there other things that I should fold into the subject that I didn't do the last time around? And I'm usually looking for things that have, uh, well, have some uh, conceptual interest and um, have some potential for being enduring ideas. Um, so here are some of the things I, I did in the, the last time this uh, past year, which I hadn't done in 2007. We talked about uh, color codes, uh, lattice surgery, and code deformation, uh, this beautiful uh, bound on uh, the trade-off between uh, distance and number of qubits in 2D that several people have mentioned, uh, the bravi koenig restriction on the level of the Clifford hierarchy we can get to with uh, constant depth circuits in D dimensions, the various ways to uh, complete the universal gate set that uh, people have been talking about the last couple of years. And although I added anions to the curriculum in 2004, now I talk explicitly about Majorana modes and quantum wires because that's how the subject is now going. You could ask yourself, uh, you know, what, what do you think we should be teaching which has the potential to be an enduring idea? So I looked at the programs for the past QEC meetings just to get an idea of what uh, used to uh, get attention, which we didn't hear about so much at this meeting. Um, one is dynamical decoupling. Certainly it's essential, very important for uh, technology, but at least for the community of people represented here, it's not a subject which is attracting a lot of attention these days from a theoretical perspective. We didn't really hear much about uh, coherent quantum control beyond the uh, paradigm of measuring syndromes and applying uh, correction. Uh, we didn't really talk about quantum repeaters, even though if we're going to distribute entanglement around the world, which we're probably eventually going to do, uh, that's something important and a lot of people are working on it. Uh, noisy channel coding is sort of now a different culture and a different meeting not very well represented here. We heard a little bit about uh, the issue of fault tolerant uh, adiabatic computing from LIDAR, and we did have uh, Latitsky uh, update us on Majoranas, but I think considering that that's one of the most exciting things in physics, it was underrepresented here. Um, the uh, skepticism of quantum error correction still exists, but it hasn't had a spokesperson at QEC since the 2007 meeting. So I tried to kind of categorize the talks. I could only do this loosely. Uh, that occurred at this meeting. Topological codes are still, of course, a big topic. Uh, but the, the main thing that uh, distinguishes this meeting, perhaps, from the previous ones is the amount of discussion of experiments uh, that are being done to start to explore quantum error correction and fault tolerance in a, uh, a serious way. And we also heard something about the uh, emerging and very exciting interest in the connections between holography and quantum gravity and quantum error correction. So what if we looked, uh, you know, not all meetings last 100 years, but, uh, but Ken and Jake uh, have aspirations to keep this one going for a while. So if we look at the, at the long-term future, where do you think this subject will be? Well, we still want to have a QEC meeting uh, 100 years from now. I don't know. Uh, qubits, I presume, will be much, 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 much better. Uh, we'll have all kinds of systems engineering we can't imagine now. 
it's kind of interesting to, to ask, uh, can we expect to have both much more accurate gates and also faster gates? We're still a ways from the fundamental limits from the laws of physics, as far as I can tell, which is that we uh, you know, should be able to do about 10 to the 48 ops uh, per second with one gram of processor uh, just coming from the Planck scale. Uh, that's the limit. We're, we're kind of stupid the way we're doing things now. We're locking up most of the energy in our processor in the rest mass of atomic nuclei. And uh, sh surely we can do better than that. I, I don't know um, about the story 100 years from now. But, but it's interesting to look at the history of classical computing when error correction was seen as essential in early days when the uh, vacuum tube technology was, was quite unreliable. It became less important as microprocessors became highly reliable. Now as we're trying to squeeze more and more features on a chip, it's becoming more important again and maybe um, will follow a similar path with quantum processors. So we have these two main approaches to scalability in fault-tolerant quantum computing. Uh, one which is mostly what we heard about at the meeting. Here I called uh, protecting using quantum error correcting codes, garden variety qubits, whichever are your favorite type, superconducting, ion trap, or whatever. And uh, of course, even there, we're using topological principles in the coding schemes that are currently preferred. And the other is topological quantum computing with enions. And you could ask, which really, in the long term, is the more promising path? And I don't know, but maybe it's not quite the right question, because perhaps over time, the distinction between the two will uh, blur, and we'll really see them as different facets of the same central idea. I think it is true that no matter how, how good our qubits get for the foreseeable future, we're going to want even better ones and even lower gate error rates. So the extent to which we can put the error protection in at the physical level, that will have big advantages. But on the other hand, even when we have much better qubits and gates than we currently do, putting coding on top will allow us to go further. So I think both of these themes are an important part of our future in some way or other. So we're entering the era now of real fault-tolerant quantum computing in experiments. And you could ask, so I learned yesterday that we're going to have these meetings every two years, although we've had four of them in the first 10 or 11 years. And so we could be asking ourselves, how do we expect the story to have changed in uh, QEC 2019? Well, we may know uh, significantly more about some of these issues in actual devices, uh, more about the limitations that come from noise correlations, how important are non-Markovian effects, the coherence, how effectively we can uh, increase reliability by some kind of noise tailoring, like twirling to suppress coherent errors, um, and how much uh, more customized can our decoders be to the type of hardware and the type of noise models that apply? What are the decoding methods which are likely to scale well as we try to scale things up? How close will we be in a couple of years to having a qubit which we can sustain for a really long time compared to a naturally occurring qubit? We may have some reasons in a couple of years to be either more encouraged or less encouraged than we currently are about the prospects for scalability in the relatively near term. And we're making the transition, or about to, from physical to logical benchmarking the randomized benchmarking methods have been quite important because they allow us to characterize noise very simply in terms of a single parameter. The infidelity averaged uniformly over the inputs, and then you can compare different platforms and different experiments using that parameterization. The story of how that uh, error rate relates to measures like the diamond norm or fault tolerant thresholds is a complicated story, as some of the speakers have remarked. There are other things you can measure that can help you to pin down, for example, the diamond norm 
uh, more accurately if we measure other things besides the average uh, infidelity. And uh, it was Poulin, I think, who, who said uh, we should think of polynoise as our free fermion model of fault tolerance. It's useful. We can simulate it efficiently. Uh, it's not the real thing. And using tensor network methods and other tricks uh, to simulate realistic noise in systems as they scale up, I think, is going to continue to draw attention. And we will soon be talking about error rates achieved at the logical level rather than just at the physical level and get a tighter understanding of how those two types of benchmarking are related. So the threshold, uh, Barbara said it is everything and nothing. It's just a number. Um, well, from a theorist perspective, yeah, it may not seem very interesting what the threshold is because it's not a universal property of a physical system. Uh, it, maybe it's a little bit analogous to the temperature at which uh, material becomes superconducting. It's just a number, but as far as the technological implications are concerned, it's an important number. So I spent a lot of, uh, a number of years actually, I'm not usually this systematic in my research agenda, uh, thinking about thresholds. And each time there was another project because there was another conceptual issue that we were hoping to address. So Daniel and I thought for a long time about how to uh, prove bounds on the threshold in the case where we concatenate distance three codes, and then whether uh, we could prove a threshold result in the case of a post-selected protocol, which Canil had suggested would give a significantly higher threshold, and then concatenating error detecting codes instead of error correcting codes, incorporating Hamiltonian non-Markovian noise in the case where the bath can be anything, but it's weakly coupled to the system, or where we know something about the bath, like it's in a Gaussian state or a low temperature thermal state. Uh, that we can still get threshold results when the noise has long-range correlations as long as they fall off with distance sufficiently rapidly, and we can take into account the bias in the noise. And so finally, at one point, uh, David Poulin said to me, why are you always proving threshold theorems? And so I thought maybe enough was enough. But um, there, was, uh, there were a couple of things that we wanted to do which we never really uh, did a good job on, which I think maybe could be revisited. And one is to... Uh, say something a little stronger about how thresholds can be related to experimentally observed parameters and also how uh, much we can prove with, with suitable but reasonable assumptions about the effectiveness of noise tailoring methods like twirling to uh, raise thresholds. We have better tools for those things now than we did a few years ago. We heard about all kinds of cool stuff here. This is not a complete list, but things that that I found very interesting. We heard about uh, codes for which, somewhat unexpectedly, we could do uh, traver transversal uh, non-Clifford gates, including the 3D surface code, and asymmetric bacon sure codes, which somehow are, even though they're in two dimensions, uh, behave like they're morally in three dimensions. Uh, we heard about how to do the Clifford group by deforming uh, surface codes. Uh, we heard about using flags to reduce the uh, number of ancilla qubits needed for doing fault tolerance. That could be a useful observation for the near-term experiments where the number of qubits will sometimes be a uh, limitation. And we heard about more fundamental things about quantum error correction, the concept of local correctability that, of course, Storiano talked about, I think, is an important advance in our understanding. And we heard about its implications for the holographic correspondence. The talk we just heard, I thought, uh, was very nice. Uh, it gave us a new perspective on the easton Canal theorem and suggested that we can do things with continuous variable codes that we can't do without them. Um, I like hearing about the uh, experimental realization of codes for continuous variable systems for uh, bosonic mode codes. When we first started thinking about that, um, it was motivated by cavity QED and the possibility that you could uh, very, uh, in very sophisticated ways, control modes of 
uh, the electromagnetic field in a cavity, but that was before cavity um, circuit QED came along. And of course, now we have very uh, impressive uh, and sophisticated means of controlling the behavior of continuous variable systems, and we even heard about doing that in ion traps. Um, I, I've been intrigued for a long time uh, by the question, can we improve quantum error correction with metrology? We heard about that from Capillaro. I'll come back to it in a minute. So, Easton and Canal, darn them. Um, they make it hard for us to do a universal set of quantum gates. We've had ways of completing the universal set uh, for some time, but a number of new ideas in the last few years, uh, such as uh, partitioning a code block in more than one way and doing transversal gates for one partition or the other, which together give us a universal set, or switching back and forth between two codes where we can do some gates transversally in one code and some uh, in the other, which together uh, complete a universal set, or gates that cause the code to drift from an initial code to a final code, which we can then fault tolerantly reset. The, the new idea uh, this year was peaceable fault tolerance, that we can do error correction several times in the midst of performing a logical gate. Um, and another sort of animal is we can consider code deformations and uh, non-stabilizer code where braiding is universal to get universal gates. So we have all these ideas, but it's kind of a zoo, and one can't help but feel that there are unifying principles that we might be missing that uh, combine all these things together in a better framework, and understanding that better might uh, suggest new ideas. Well, I was glad we heard from uh, Latinsky, Latinsky about uh, Majorana modes. Um, I don't know if 2018 is going to be the year of the Majorana qubit, but it's possible. And he explained how we can encode a qubit in four Majoranas, where a pair of Majoranas are um, at ends of some kind of quantum wire under the right physical conditions. And we know how by braiding to do the single qubit Clifford group, if we want to do entangling gates, we have to make uh, measurements on pairs of qubits. And um, there are ways of doing that. Uh, the types of anions that are realized in these systems don't have universal braiding, so there's some non-topological gate that has to be done. Um, it can then be improved using the usual uh, state distillation tricks, and there are ideas about how to do it fairly accurately through dynamical decoupling. Now, the nice thing is that the braiding can be done just by turning off and on couplings between such wires, opening and closing valves, in effect. So that gives one universal control over a single qubit. And you might think that doesn't sound very topological, but what makes it topological is that when you turn off the switch, it's really firmly turned off. And that means one can get very robust berry phases in the control over a single qubit. And there's a scenario which I hope uh, we'll see experimentally realized in the not too distant future, uh, discussed, for example, in this paper by Asin et al., that with a trijunction of device, by turning uh, couplings on and off, with suitable gates, we can realize the exchange of two Majoranas in a sequence of steps. And that would be like the rotation of a single topological qubit by pi over 2 about the x-axis. And one could check that doing uh, two such rotations will flip the qubit, and doing two more will flip it back. And so we may have a means of validating the performance of a topological qubit in the pretty near future by that strategy. I've been interested for a long time in the question of self-correcting quantum memory. We would like eventually to have a quantum hard drive, some system in which we can store quantum information and keep it robustly for a long time. That can be kind of codified as a set of criteria we would like a physical system to satisfy. We would like to just have some Hamiltonian with a degenerate code space where the encoded states stay robust. 
in the presence of a bath at non-zero temperature. And the important thing is we would like the memory time to grow exponentially with the system size at some non-zero temperature and be able to efficiently decode the stored information. And we've known for a while we can do this with uh, four-dimensional topological codes, but it's still open whether it can be done in uh, less than four dimensions. That was Zhang Wenha's thesis problem, and he didn't solve it, although he did find some very interesting things. There are some uh, questions which are of interest, at least to me, as sort of fundamental questions about resources. Um, a couple of people have referred to uh, Gottesman's result, which at least asymptotically and for LDP CE codes with uh, the right properties, we can reduce the space overhead in fault tolerance to a constant factor, which can in fact uh, be close to one. That's assuming that we have fast and reliable classical computing. We don't worry about the resources we need to decode these codes and where we don't worry about geometric locality of the quantum gates. So that's an interesting result. From my point of view, what's sort of more fundamental is a question about of physics is what can we do when all the processing is quantum and all of it is noisy, but not necessarily restricted by geometric locality. We conjectured some time ago that we can do a simulation in which the blow up in circuit size, that is the number of physical gates you need to uh, do a circuit, an ideal circuit with uh, L gates, is larger than the number of ideal gates by a factor which is close to log squared of the circuit size, and that the depth blows up by a factor of uh, log log L, where L is the circuit size. And the idea was to use high dimension topological codes, and in order to get universal gates, to measure logical blocks by a kind of renormalization group decoding, which wasn't restricted by geometric locality. And uh, I worked on that a while back with a student, Charlene Ahn, and for a while we thought we had proved it, but there was a hole in our proof we never uh, were able to fill. So I'm still interested in what we can say ultimately about the cost of fault tolerance in terms of size and depth blow up as a matter of principle. And in particular, in the classical case, we can do a simulation with noisy gates where the depth blow up is just a constant. And I am curious about whether that's possible quantumly. If it's not, it's a rather fundamental distinction between fault tolerant quantum and classical computing. So we have this climb towards scalability, which we're beginning uh, the ascent. And how steep is the climb? How long is the climb? It's pretty steep. It's pretty long. I, I think we. Um, we have a tendency to be a little too optimistic in the short run about technological advances, but too pessimistic in the long run. Um, there's a long way to go, and that means that there's lots of opportunity for new insights and developments to substantially change the outlook going forward, something for all of us to be thinking about. Quantum error correction is a great idea. It should be great not just for fault-tolerant quantum computing, but for other things. Quantum metrology is one thing where it has potential. So Capillaro said that perhaps we have just scratched the surface of what can be done to advanced quantum sensing using quantum coding. So I tweeted that. And John Dowling replied that he had said the same thing in 1998, and a Caltech professor had told him he was crazy. <laughs> and I don't actually remember saying that he was crazy, but it is true that I was kind of discouraged at the time because I had been thinking about how to improve metrology with quantum error correction and was having difficulty because the error correction that would suppress the noise would, in many cases, suppress the signal as well. And it wasn't clear that one would get uh, in scenarios that people cared about experimentally, a significant advance in signal-to-noise. Well, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, since then. And in fact, uh, CC Zhu had a poster on some uh, recent work 
where I joined with uh, the Yale group, where at least we've succeeded under a rather idealized setting to find the necessary and sufficient condition for Heisenberg scaling. That is, in the face of Markovian noise, we would like the way precision of a sensing measurement scales with the total probing time to go like 1 over t rather than 1 over square root of t, as it typically would in the presence of noise, unless we do something sophisticated to combat the noise. And we could say what uh, the condition on the Lindblad operator describing the noise and the Hamiltonian is for uh, that to be possible. But the setting is that we assume we have ancillas which are completely error-free, as well as a noisy probe subject to Markovian noise, and that we can do quantum gates with arbitrary accuracy and as quickly as we want. And of course, that's not a very realistic setting. It's inspired in part by the case of NB centers, where we have nuclear spins, which are much more noise resistant than the electron spins that can be used as probes. But I think it's interesting to continue thinking about, under more realistic assumptions, what kind of improvements in quantum metrology can be achieved with air correction. And I think an especially exciting opportunity is the developing interface between quantum gravity and uh, quantum error correction. So of course, we would like to have a better understanding of quantum gravity. I got five minutes, OK. Um, that uh, it's the fundamental thing about nature about which uh, there is still, um, well, our understanding is still lacking, where there's an opportunity for big advances and how well we understand nature at a fundamental level. And that could help us to understand the quantum physics of black holes, the origin of the universe, and so on. We're not getting a lot of experimental guidance currently um, to help us find our way. But I'm an optimist. I think maybe we're smart enough to just figure it out. And the best tool we currently have is this remarkable correspondence, which uh, several speakers have alluded to between quantum gravity in negatively curved anti de Sitter space-time and a non-gravitational theory, a conformal field theory, on the boundary of the space-time. And the recent insight, originally from Almeri, Dong, and Harlow, is that we can think of the dictionary that relates observables in the bulk space-time and observables on the boundary as a kind of quantum error correcting code, the encoding map of an error correcting code. So one way of thinking about that is this. In the bulk space time, causality is satisfied at least to an excellent approximation. So there's no signaling outside the light cone. And you can imagine that a bomb explodes deep inside the bulk. An observer on the boundary isn't going to find out that the bomb exploded until much later when a light signal from the explosion can reach the boundary. But if there's an exact correspondence, the explosion of the bomb corresponds to some operator acting deep inside the bulk. That operator corresponds to an operator acting on the boundary, but which should be undetectable by the observer on the boundary. Well, the way it works is that the observable on the boundary is extremely non-local, so the local observables, observers can't see that anything changed. It is, in fact, the operator of a quantum error correcting code where local observers don't see that anything happened when the state evolves in the code space. And as Harlow emphasized in his talk on Monday, this point of view that the dictionary is really the encoding map of a code helps us to understand a number of things that would otherwise be puzzling. Uh, for example, the relationship between entropy on the boundary and geometry in the bulk makes more sense when we realize that it only applies in some suitable code space. The fact that bulk logical operators deep inside the bulk space-time can be reconstructed on the boundary in multiple ways makes sense if you realize we're just talking about a code. It's the statement that a logical operator can be represented as a physical operator in uh, many ways. Well, there are lots of questions about this correspondence, some of which have come up in the talks. We would like to understand 
in a more precise way just what it means to say that a conformal field theory, this boundary theory, can be regarded as an approximate quantum error correcting code. Uh, we'd like to understand how the um, evolution on the boundary governed by some local Hamiltonian uh, can correspond to bulk evolution, evolution, logical evolution, and still be consistent with the easton Knell theorem. Um, we'd like to understand what we can learn about the interior of a black hole by applying appropriate decoding to the boundary. And in the longer term, we'd like to be able to extend these ideas beyond the toy example of anti de Sitter space, which is not the space time we really live in, to uh, more realistic cases like de Sitter space with the positive cosmological constant, which is where we live. And that's harder because that space time doesn't have a boundary and it's less obvious how to think about the observables. But the idea of error correction may help to guide us in understanding the observables in other settings. So if you want to get into this subject, you have some of the tools, you know something about codes, you know something about tensor networks. What you might be missing and you might want to brush up on is conformal field theory. So by putting together conformal field theory, coding, and tensor networks, I think you'd be well tooled to help make progress. So quantum error correction is still a very exciting field and I think will continue to be. Uh, we're at the stage now where various hardware platforms are ready for serious demonstrations of quantum error correction and fault tolerance. Um, I think it's quite intriguing that we can now use continuous variable coding in some uh, settings like in uh, circuit QED and explore the potential of that. Topological protection is, it seems, becoming a reality quite soon and we can anticipate topologically protected qubits uh, convincingly demonstrated in the not too distant future. Uh, I didn't really talk about this because it wasn't represented in the conference, but there may be other ways of incorporating error protection at a physical level in some kinds of qubits and special types of superconducting qubits. I think that's exciting. We have an opportunity to explore further the potential benefits of quantum error correction and metrology. Another thing that didn't really come up here, but I think it's important, are the ways in which quantum error correcting codes can illuminate our understanding of quantum phases of matter. And I think it's particularly exciting that quantum error correction is giving us new insights into quantum gravity and in particular the nature of the holographic correspondence in uh, ADS CFT. So quantum error correction is still a very vibrant subject in 2017, and I think we can be confident that will continue for some years ahead. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Do you think when the dust starts to settle and uh, we start getting a scalable device, there'll be one technology that wins out and we all collapse to be, become engineers in that one technology? Or there'll be several ones that'll, in the end, become viable? And I'll be especially happy if you name, if you place bets on which ones. And <laughs> well, I think it's really important that um, a number of different technologies are being pursued now. I think we're far from being able to make a uh, you know, confident statement about what technology will in the long term have the best potential for scalability. So I'm happy that for now uh, people are trying a lot of different things. And as far as whether it will eventually collapse, uh, well it might in a sense but not in another sense. It may be that there will be a, a preferred technology for the purpose of large-scale quantum computing, but other technologies will have niches uh, you know, that are relevant for quantum communication or for quantum sensing. And so I think you know, this is a very rich and broad field that we're working in. And we shouldn't think that we have just one goal. And quantum technology and quantum error correction, I think, has uh, many ramifications, not all of which we have yet appreciated. 
the questions? Well, so you mentioned a couple times um, well, zero pi qubits that use superinductance to suppress yeah. errors at the hardware level. Um, but there are a few other developments that have happened. And um, if you look at threshold error rates for codes and error rates that can be realized in hardware, they've both moved maybe three orders of magnitude-ish over the last 20 years. Um, so where, where do we go to learn more about the hardware and how to design it to be sort of um, maybe not fault tolerant, but no faults in the first place? Well, of course, uh, so the question is, uh, if we want to make really big advances in gate error rates, uh, what's the best approach? Uh, or where can people who are experts in quantum error correction try and uh, study up on the other approach? Yeah. Well, I, uh, of course, well, part of the answer is topological quantum computing, where, you know, in order to, for example, realize um, universal gates, which uh, can be achieved, say, by braiding, we're going to need different devices than the ones people are working on now. And I think that's not just a materials problem. There are conceptual problems where people with a quantum error correction background, if they you know, learn a little bit about topological matter, can make a helpful contribution. You mentioned the zero pi qubit. Uh, that's a particular approach to making a robust qubit in a superconducting circuit. So one thing that's nice about the superconducting circuits is there's lots of uh, freedom and parameter space to fool around with those circuits and uh, explore new regimes. And I think people, and I'm glad that people will uh, continue to do that. And for uh, theorists, you know, we made some uh, some first attempts to discuss how a well-protected qubit in a superconducting circuit could uh, also admit very accurate logic. But very few people have worked on that. And I think if more people looked at it, we could make some further progress. Any other questions? OK, then thank the, let's thank the speaker again. Thank